Hi, this is David Jassy from DMJ Studios in New York. Okay, you're ready to produce your sales and marketing film. You bought all the equipment, the lights, and then you realize just the way it took you about 20 years to learn your profession, whether you're a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, it also took me 20 years to learn my profession. I got my start at CNN, MTV, CBS, Current Affair, been part of Emmy Award winning TV shows, and I've worked with corporate clients like Bristol Myers Squibb, Home Depot, Mass Mutual, the National Kidney Foundation, and we'd like to take our expertise and work with you to produce compelling video and digital marketing. Hey folks, it's David Jassy live from New York. Welcome to our Branding Through Video webinar. Glad to have you aboard. We want everybody to participate today. Please let us know who you are in the chat. Give us your LinkedIn address. Feel free to network over there. It's really important that everybody takes away as much as they can today. You got to stay tuned to the end. We're going to give away a little bit of free things right now, and we're going to give you some free stuff at the end. And also stay tuned at the end. We're going to hear market research from Dennis Zhao from InjuryLawyer.com, who's going to put the numbers to all the things we're talking about today. So we're going to start off giving away a couple of things. We said who's ever registered is going to win. So congratulations to Kurt Austin and Roy Schneider for giving away some coffee, chocolate, whiskey. We're going to decide who's getting what a little later. So before we get into specifically video branding, the question is, what is branding and why is it so important? I got to tell you about this short little video I saw many years ago. It was about the Mitsubishi Eclipse versus the Plymouth Laser. Two sports cars in the 80s and 90s came out the same year. Everybody was looking to see who was going to sell more cars. Turns out Mitsubishi Eclipse sold more cars. They sold it for more money and the Plymouth Laser had more complaints. And you know what the big new idea and the big surprise is? It was the same car, folks, came off the same assembly. So it's not important, it's important to be good at what you do, but it's also important to have a trusted brand. So that's why branding is so important. There are some people out there who are really good at what they do and they look kind of amateurish. And then there's plenty of people out there who are amateurish, amateurish and they look great because they have a good brand. So that's what we're talking about branding today. We're gonna to be talking about a few different things. We're gonna talk about doing it yourself, doing video on the cheap, or hiring professionals. You saw a little bit about that in the, the show open. Second thing we're gonna be talking about is how to reach your audience through authentic storytelling, a story that comes from the heart, touches the heart very often. So sometimes people, yell right to camera and sell. We're gonna talk about, is that effective? Is that the best way to sell? Or maybe we should go more for the authentic storytelling. And then finally, in these days with social media and so many different channels, it's really important that you work with a production company like us that maximizes your return on investment. What does that mean? That we're gonna shoot plenty of content that's gonna have a long life. You're gonna hear about that today. A lot of the footage we shot four years ago for InjuryLawyer.com is still being utilized today. It's pretty amazing. So now I'd like to introduce you, my guests, and, uh, and we have Dennis Zhao from InjuryLawyer.com. Nice to see you today, Dennis, how are you? Great, nice to see you as well, David. I'm glad you and Dan were able to get on the, on the pre-call and work on actual projects today. Since everybody's on the clock, we have Always to- Always working. We always have to do a little business, always working. And wonderful Dan Galway, 15-time Emmy Award-winning producer who works closely with DMJ and with Dennis on all the uh, uh, commercials and ads for InjuryLawyer.com. How are you today, Dan? Good. How are you? Terrific. All right. So let's get right into it. The first subject is, does it make sense to do it yourself, do it on the cheap, or hire a professional company. So we're going to go first to you, Dennis, and let's hear about your experience working with us on your commercials and what's your advice, doing it on the cheap, doing it yourself, or hiring a pro? Great. Uh, so just to give a little bit of context, um, I started working at, <clears throat> excuse me, I started working at the Rothenberg Law Firm um, a little under four years ago. Time really flies. 
Um, and it's a law firm with over 50 years experience. They've been around They're one of the first to advertise in television. So I'm, I'm dealing with attorneys and partners who understand marketing, right? So um, in terms of branding, I think one of the first thing I, I, I said to them is we need to elevate the quality of our commercials. Forget about the script, forget about the content of the commercial. It's incredibly important. And later, a little later on, we're going to go into um, image and perception, right? Intention and perception. Um, and we're going to understand that the perception is extremely important. So if you're a law firm and you want to look like a, a multi-million dollar, billion dollar law firm, your video needs to match that. So coming in right off the bat, realize that the quality of these uh, of our commercials it needs to be elevated. So I vetted- tell, I us a, tell us a little story, Dennis. Tell us a story about when we first started to work together, what you were doing at the time and what you changed up. Right, I mean, at the time we were doing a lot of standard, you know, uh, injury lawyer commercials where it's a, a it's attorney in front of a green screen yelling and selling. That's the style of, that's what I kind of coined what that commercial is, yelling and selling. And it just came off as cheap for me, for a lack of a better word. Um, so talking to Dave right away, I kind of saw some of his work. I'm like, this is the type of quality that we're reaching for. Um, and then after that, I mean, that's just the fundamental, just getting the, uh, the, sh the shot and editing down. Um, but I can tell you that working with uh, a, like an outfit that knows what they're doing, it's a night and day difference. You know, okay. I live in Greece. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Dave. So I want to hear a little bit from Dan. Talk to us when we first started. I'll tell you guys, I'd like to tell the audience a little story about how we got started. I met Mr. Rothenberg at a social event. I spoke to Dennis and the whole team for maybe six months, a year before we started doing anything together. And the first assignment was to shoot Mr. Rothenberg on green screen. And that's it. And being in television and video and broadcast television for 25 years, I knew I needed more than just somebody selling to camera. So I convinced them to bring in actors. You'll be seeing some of those spots later. And I worked really hard to convince them that we should also do an interview. So we progressed from just on camera to adding actors to adding authentic interviews over the four years working together. So Dan, tell us a little bit about where we started when we were working with Rothenberg and then where it progressed to. Yeah, well, Rothenberg was actually one of the first major projects I worked on with DMJ and David, and it was kind of serendipitous. You know, I came from, as he mentioned, uh, I've won a bunch of Emmys. I worked with a great team at a production company, RGTVD, RGTV. We did a bunch of uh, sports programming for MSG Network and sports shows that were syndicated nationally. Much of that was documentary style. And when David and I started talking about Rothenberg and how to elevate their production, one of the major things that came to mind based on my experience and also David's experience with nonprofits was we have to, we have to humanize the uh, Rothenberg law firm because Mr. Rothenberg's a legend. Um, he's been on Philadelphia TV for many, many years, and he has his own style. And that was kind of the challenge. We saw his style, and we knew his style was effective, but we also wanted to help Dennis usher in kind of a new era of broadcasting for the law client, for them. For them. And uh, so we had to go bits and pieces and push them towards a uh, documentary style production. And that's, that's really what we did. We... Uh, David offered to uh, interview them. We also, he also pushed to bring in actors and shoot B-roll of them interacting with the, the partners at the law firm. And that really allowed me as an editor to have a lot more to work with uh, when we got back to the editing room, not just the traditional um, talking to the, the camera with a green screen and teleprompter, but also create some spots that took a step away from what Rothenberg was used to doing. I want to put some visuals to all the things we're talking about. I think it'll tell us a lot. So I want to queue up the first spot. And here you go. 
I am Alan Rothenberg, the injury lawyer. I'm Alan Rothenberg, the injury lawyer. I've been fighting and winning on behalf of my clients for over 50 years. Let us stand up to the insurance companies for you. Let us protect your rights. Let us care for you. Let us fight for you. You need a law firm with the experience, resolve, and passion to fight to get you as much money as you need and deserve. You need the Rothenberg Law Firm. 1-800-624-8888 or go to InjuryLawyer.com. So what you're looking there is a lot of things. You're looking at a, a wonderful actor named Dennis, who we got to play in the, uh, the commercial. You're looking at really good keying work that Dan did because that was on green screen. We had a lot of choices. I mentioned that we had the opportunity and we convinced them that they should use some actors. And I thought that worked out tremendously uh, well. Uh, let's hear your thoughts on that spot. What are we looking at, Dennis? Oh, yeah, I think that spot kind of exemplifies the epitome of what a talk like a yelling and selling spot could be right it's a very high quality spot i like what was being stated i like the messaging um and based on david's recommendation we brought in actors we added the b-roll the spot itself looked much higher quality than what we've some of the work that we've done in the past so i was happy with it but you know this is a process so dan, you know dan we'll tell me about the process that uh, dennis is talking about uh, first of all, just a little bit about hiring and workers and working as a team. You know, when you bring people aboard, first you direct them, then you coach them, and then, God willing, you could delegate. When you bring in a 15-time Emmy Award-winning, very talented storyteller, it's an absolute pleasure. You can work magic with the stuff and I direct. So I just want to plug that for Dan. So Dan and Dennis work very closely on all those spots. Tell us about that collaboration, Dan, with you and Dennis. Well, Dennis has been fantastic to work uh, with on these. You know, he has a great creative eye and he's willing to kind of try to push the boundary of what has been done before. So that has really been key in, in taking these spots to higher levels. Um, as for that specific spot, you know, as I just mentioned before, we want, I had experience doing documentary style pr production and we wanted to humanize um, and we kind of did that with that spot. You know, we used the archival content to, in the first few seconds of the spot, you saw that, you know, Alan Rothenberg has been around for a long time and that adds real credibility to him. And then with the kind of the classical music added another higher kind of production value feel to it. And the B-roll, like I said before, that spot wouldn't have been able to exist in its, in its current form without the B-roll. It would have just been you know, Alan talking to the camera and it wouldn't have moved as it did. It wouldn't have probably fit with that music. So, you know, people say things are three dimensional. I say editing, you know, it's, it's almost like five dimensional. You know, every decision has offshoots of what can be possible and, and what's gonna be made as the end product. And just having an experienced team to work with, with David and myself and working with Dennis who you know, wanted to push these commercials forward, that was integral to really getting that spot done. Fantastic. I want to talk a little bit about quality. We, the subject we're talking about is doing it yourself, doing it on the cheap, or hiring a professional team. And what's the difference? And what do you get for it? So I want to show you this spot, because we've been working together with the Rothenberg Law Firm for four years. And I don't know, after about two years, we brought in a red, we brought in a, a better DP. And as we have mentioned, storytelling is very important. Authentic authenticity is important. So what you're going to see in this next spot is high quality images, and you're going to see it intercut once again with you know one-on-one -on -one interviews. So it's two camera speaking, and you're going to see some interviews as well. Very often, your own insurance company is your adversary. I represented a client who paid his premium for 45 years and didn't make any claims. His own insurance company, they tried to disclaim coverage. Whether it's fighting an insurance company, whether it's fighting huge pharmaceutical companies, there's always a defense. The problem is that defense is a falsehood. It's a lie at the Rothenberg Law Firm. It's our duty to make sure our clients get everything they are entitled to. 1-800-624-8888 or go to injurylawyer.com. It's on you, Dennis. Tell us what we just saw. What are your feelings about that spot? Fantastic spot. Um, and the best part of it, none of that is scripted. None of that was read from a teleprompt. 
like David said, it came from the heart and you can tell um, the emotion that Ross is invoking to kind of, uh, to pass that message that he's trying to make. And I think it makes a world of difference. I think if you took that exact, everything he said, you put it into a Word doc, you put it on a teleprompt, it would be a very, the outcome would be very different. Doug, yeah, uh, sure. Dan, what do you think? What comes um, to mind when you see that spot? Yeah, it's absolutely true. You know, on a teleprompter, that wouldn't have the same feel. And to me, you know, oh, authentic is always better. Uh, David style of interviewing somebody and pulling the best bites out of them. And then, you know, the editor going through and seeing what really rings true to them. That's the best way to do these uh, spots. You can have an idea of where you want to go and you should if you're advertising. Um, but if you're able to pull it off with authentic answers instead of scripted content, it's going to come across a lot more authentic and I think it's going to be a lot more impactful. Dennis, what do you think is the most important thing for the audience to know about whether they should do it themselves, whether they should do it on the cheap, or whether they should hire a professional company? Obviously, we're a professional company and we're going to tout that because there's nothing like experience, whether you're the best ice skater or the best anything, you usually have years and years of practice. But now we have AI, we have all these tools and cheap tools. Tell us your thoughts on doing it on the cheap versus investing a little bit of money. Right, so to go back onto what I was saying earlier, this is not where you wanna save money on, right? Because this is creating the perception and the image of your company. You want to you want to look like a billion dollar law firm, but you know this is this is where you invest you know a decent amount of money. You find a good company like DMJ, and you and you get good quality work from them. Um, if you if you had to save money, because there's plenty of I mean we've worked with plenty of outfits before that um, charges a fraction of what DMJ charges, but the work is I think that is actually at the detriment of the firm to, to continue to use them. And that's exactly how it spelled it out to the partners to have them make that investment. You know, we're spending exponentially more, but I think the benefit is, is more than what we're paying, much more. Dan, you got any stories in all your years of production where somebody didn't have the time and money to do it right, but they had the time and money to do it over? I think all of us have gotten involved in projects where you tried saving money and it was a disaster. Do you have any of those stories? I don't have a specific story, but I know I've worked on projects before where there's a harsh timeline because, you know, time is money in this business. You pay hourly or you pay per day a lot of times for the editor. Or, and I, I won Emmy Awards as a videographer, as a writer, as a producer. Um, and then I became frustrated as I'd hand off the material and, you know, there wouldn't be the budget to spend as much time as needed to really pull the best out of that material. So that's what, you know, led to me really starting my own production company um, and becoming an editor full time for, for a lot of, for a long period. Um, and if you don't have the time, like it still kills me if I, I can't work on a project where I don't have time to properly screen it because if you don't properly screen it, and what that means is, you know, take the interview footage, watch it down, cut out selects, um, and watch all of it down and have that in your memory bank to really try to make the best product possible. If the budget is cut and that's um, not available and you want to just have it transcribed and go from a pa make a paper cut off what's said, um, you're not going to get the same product because not everything's going to be said in the way that you want it to be said or you picture it being said. So while I don't have a, a story of a production going down in flames because not enough money was spent, I can tell you from my experience, if you don't spend the money to give the proper time to the team to, to make the best video possible, it's not going to be what it could be. You know, I've been doing this for more than 25 years. And I even try and do things on the cheap. I tell everybody cheap is expensive. And my dad, he should rest in peace, always said, you know, do it right, spend the money. 
but I still go on the cheat and like nine times out of 10, I pay the price. The person doesn't understand it. You have to do it again. Um, I try Fiverr and I say, oh, I could just get this. I, I try four Fiverr artists. I don't know if any of you guys have gone that route. And then I pay the real, the, the real thing, the, extra, the, the money, and it gets done better and it gets done quicker. And by the way, I want to mention that about producer editors. You work with Dan. He's more expensive per hour. It comes out better and it gets done quicker and it costs less. Uh, we have editors and producers who work for less money. It takes longer. It doesn't come out as good and it, it doesn't work. I, I mean, there's nothing like experience. And we're going to hear that from uh, Alan Rothenberg right now. Practice of law, especially injury law, is not a science. It takes a lot of expertise. It takes a lot of experience. It takes a lot of talent. Why the Rothenberg Law Firm? We've seen it all. We've done it all. What's the most important criteria that they use in real estate? Location, location, location. With us, it's experience, experience, and experience. The Rothenberg Law Firm, over 50 years of experience, billions won and collected for injured people. Guys, I want to congratulate you. That's a beautiful spot. That's a sincere read from Ross at the end. I got to compliment Shmuel Hoffman, the DP on the red over there. He was standing up on the desk when I started in this business 20 years ago, one of the teachers said, what did the photographer do other than record what was there? Shmuel is up on the desk getting every angle imaginable to man. What's it like, Dan, to work with that kind of footage? Oh, it's great. You know, you get excited when you, you screen it. You get ideas about how you can use it as you're going through it. And it's something that comes across subconsciously to the audience. You know, the audience might not know it's shot 4K, ProRes, you know, flat for better color correction, but they do know what it looks like with the final product, and it will look better than something shot on a, a prosumer camera. So, you know, that that in its own way is sort of an actor in the spot. You know, the quality of the optics and the quality of the camera and how it's shot, obviously all those play, you know, huge, meaningful parts in, in why the spot comes across so well. Dennis, what do you like about that spot? I mean, he uh, and Shmuel transformed that scene. Like that's not a green screen. That is our office and it looks superb. I was like shocked at how amazing it looked. Uh, the, the light was actually dimming, was kind of coming into late at night and I was worried about the lighting. And he's like, don't worry. And this is, this is where spending money works, like comes in handy. Um, it's like, don't worry, just sit back and watch. And uh, what came out, like the footage that came out was magical. So um, really fantastic. Let's go to another video. As Warner Wolf would say, let's go to the video. I grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'm going to take you where I spent my entire childhood, the jewelry district. I was the errand boy. Okay, I learned a lot. That's where I got my exercise, running up and down those steps. I learned, treat the clients well, they will come back to you. There's no job that was too small and no job that was too big. The same thing with us. The Rothenberg Law Firm, over 50 years of experience, billions won and collected for injured people. Gentlemen, beautiful job. Everybody from whoever was doing those interviews, I haven't directed all those films. Um, fantastic, why? When we hear a speech, what do we remember? When do we get interested? When there's a great story, there's a great story there. Dan, tell me how you made that spot. Uh, and Dennis, together, you guys made it together. So tell me, how, how do you make a spot like that? Well, I wasn't on the shoot. That was another Shmuel production. But I remember we spoke about it beforehand. Um, and we mentioned possibly getting some footage of Mr. Rothenberg in the car. Uh, wasn't really sure if that was going to happen, but we really pushed for it because I thought it could come across and everybody else thought it could, could come across as a lot more authentic. You know, somebody like Mr. Rothenberg, who's been talking to the camera for years, he's comfortable with it. And I, I've seen, I just knew that, you know, he's a natural, he'd be able to pull it off. Um, and not only did he pull it off, I think he was just himself. And I think that's what was captured in the car. And to me, you know, that's an incredibly powerful piece of advertising because 
you get his backstory, you get why he works hard and not to come back to the same thing. He's human. He's human. And then he closes it out with a great line. So to me, I thought that came out great. Dennis, what do you think about that spot? And what did it take to create it? Was it transcripts? Was it Dan? Was it you and Dan? Was it the law firm? How did the creative, how does the creative work either on this spot or in general? I think that spot comes together by trusting in the human being, right? We're saying that for branding, being human is more important than ever. I looked at someone who has been on TV, who has created an entire brand for himself. And I looked at him and I said, you know what? This person, as great as he was on TV, this person, when I actually talked to him, he's much greater. I want to capture that side of him. And, and then it's believing that if we just had a camera next to him and just filmed that we're going to get good material. And that's exactly what happened here. Let's and not to piggyback on that, you know, I, every decision I make in the edit room is based on, you know, making that image on the, the screen become a human being again. I feel like, you know, the camera's there and it's kind of, you know, in between the person, the talent and being a human being, and you bring them back through your choices with editing. So um, I, that, that's really, you gotta stay flexible. And, you know, somebody else could have taken on the Rothenberg client and stuck with what they liked and done a good job doing that, maybe pushed a little bit, um, changed up a little bit, but credit to David. He always wants to make stuff better. He's always thinking about how to make stuff better. Um, and he's great at dealing with clients and, you know, even if they're not ready yet, you know, putting in their head that maybe we could do something a little bit better down the road. And that paid off at this spot. And, you know, he was a human being in that spot. Not that he wasn't beforehand, but you know, you could really connect to him. And to Dennis's point, you know, meeting him and talking to Mr. Rothenberg, you know, that's, that's what you come away with that. He's a human being that he's committed to what he does, that he loves working and he loves helping people. And I think that that did come across. I, I want to move to the subject of, you know, cheap is expensive sometimes. And everybody's been speaking about how, oh, we spent a substantially amount of more money on production to get a good camera crew. Oh, we spent a substantially uh, significant amount on the editor. I want to disagree with those two things because as far as return on investment on our productions, I have to, you know, I'm biased. I'm going to say it, but then we'll hear from you guys. The way we've been able to take four years of material and repurpose it to probably more than 100 spots, Dennis will correct me. Let's talk about the longevity of the, the material. Let's talk about moving to digital and, you know, repurposing the material. Tell us about repurposing the material and have you been able to get a good return on the money, Dennis, even though you guys invested a little bit more up front? Right. We spent a lot more on shooting this footage, shooting the interview, shooting the B-roll. And even when I, even before, you know, the shoot, I said to the partners um, that this is investment and this investment will pay off because the beauty of editing these more human moments, these non-scripted moments is that you can, there's so much more material, right? With a, with a green screen and a script, you're only able to capture the number of, you know, spots that you have scripts for, and that's it. I mean, you can edit a little here and there, but you're not changing the content of the spot. And with this, we even, even now from our first shoot four years ago, um, we're still, we're still, uh, we're still going back and I'll say to Dan, Hey, Dan, like, remember that sound bite from, uh, from the shoot in Lakewood, like that thing could, that could work. And Dan's like, you know what, you may be right. And, and then it would, would make its way into one of our newer spots and no one would know any, no one's the wiser. Dan, talk about repurposing and some of the assignments you got from Rothenberg. Dan, uh, they say, Dan, see how many spots you could make from this, that, and the other thing. Tell everybody about, you know, really getting a lot of mileage out of the footage. Well, I mean, just from the first shoot, when we came back, we initially did the spots that were scripted and rent to camera, and we got a bunch of those done. And then I can't remember whether it was in the budget or not, but, you know, I started going through the interviews on, on time that I had and pulling, you know, bites from, from, from the interview and kind of assembling them in rough 30, 45, 15 second, um, 
little timelines of what could be possible. And I eventually, I sent that to Dennis and kind of opened his eyes, I think, to, to what could be possible with the, the documentary style interviews. Not that he didn't know, but it's different, you know, being there at the interview and thinking something's possible and then seeing things ordered, uh, how they may play on the screen. And, you know, from there, you know, it was an integral part of our workflow. We incorporated, incorporated it going flow, forward. And as Dennis said, you know, I feel like I could go back to those initial interviews and maybe pull four or five more spots out of them with, you know, with the new context of what we've done, um, the, the four shoots and the many over a hundred spots we've done for them. You know, if you're in a different state of mind, it's always possible to pull more out of it. So, you know, those, those, those video assets that we recorded going forward, we have them um, to, to always pull from. I, I need to mention something that expensive is relative because even though the Rothenberg Law Firm uh, considers this relatively high budget, it's really compared to where they came from. If you compare this to a typical commercial production, typical commercial productions are way, way more expensive. People are probably getting the wrong idea here. I'm not going to give the exact numbers, but we have lean and mean crews and a guy like Shmuel Hoffman who comes out with a lot of small lights and he's German and he knows exactly what he wants. He's creative on one hand, but very precise on the other. We get a lot of material. And when you talk about a director like David Jassy, who's good at drawing out materials, we get a lot of content. And now I wanna move on to the last commercial, which really illustrates what we've been talking about today. Going from selling right to camera and going towards the documentary. So we did a, a documentary piece of the family um, and Dennis will tell us after we watch it, how they're using it. I can't remember a time in my life when I wasn't telling my friends and anybody else who would listen that I'm going to be a lawyer. I did not know that the next six younger siblings were going to join me. Six of my seven children are partners, and a seventh is a former federal prosecutor who works with me on special litigation. How many businesses will you ever see with mom and dad and seven of eight siblings all in the law firm? We all get along. It's amazing. My parents, the most important trait that they've instilled within us is honesty and integrity. There's no divide at all between what we do outside the firm and what we do inside the firm. Everyone here puts the client's interests first. There's no amount that they will not spend to make sure that they get every single dollar that the client is due. I love working for the Rothenbergs because they're amazing people. And our clients are more like family than they are clients. So much goes into making a beautiful production like that. You know, a lot, of, I, I mentioned that we were gonna speak a little bit about artificial intelligence. The finesse of the music, the finessing of the camera, the finessing <laughs> of the interviews, of the content, you just can't replace human beings from directing. What do you think about all that? And what do you think about being replaced, Dennis? And what do you think about being replaced, Dan, whoever wants to go first? I think I've got a runway for a little bit, but I think that there will be a market for, you know, computer edited um, videos in the future. Like it'd be... It'd probably be stupid to think that there wouldn't be, but they're also, as David, as you've said, they're tools and we're going to figure out how to use them to be more efficient and to make stuff that we couldn't make before uh, because we need a few extra hands. So that's my hopeful look on it. And, you know, if I'm eventually replaced by then, hopefully I'll, I'll have figured out what my next venture will be. Dennis, what do you think about AI? Uh, everything you read, I think bankers, even lawyers, a lot of professions will eventually be replaced by AI. It's a matter of when. But the one thing that even like the most hardcore technologists would say is creative work would still have a place. And that's where human beings will delve more towards, like more creative, the more creative aspect of um, and creating things, you know, using their mind. So I think that um, there, there's some, there's some elements that will be replaced, but you always need 
a human driver to really be there to make that judgment call, call of like, is this a sound, right? Is this a sound um, spot or not? So to wrap up today, we moved from doing it yourself to more authentic, to better production value. And we had a lot of nice discussions and I wanna thank you guys for joining us. Now we wanna know about the facts. It's very nice that we all like the, the footage and so forth, but uh, I think Julie, uh, and I wanna give a shout out to Julie and Susan and Marianne, all the people behind the scenes who made this show happen. So I can't, uh, I can't go on without thanking the uh, production team who helped put this uh, webinar together. Thanks so much, you did a great job. On to some facts, to put some facts to the metal. So could we go to a full screen of the facts and Dennis, tell us about what you found when you, first tell us what type of market research did you do and then tell us what you found out. Right, so um, the market research that, so first of all, I always believe in that the saying, the proof is in the pudding, right? You want to, like you have, you have all the ideas in the world, but did it, did it result in something that has a net positive? And to do that, you know, you never want to take anything for granted. Um, and you want to go and, and that's where market research is so pivotal is to test, you know, is to test out what you created so you can learn from it and you can create something better. Um, and the market research that we did, we went to the outfit, they, uh, they put our commercial along with two other uh, law firms commercials in front of about 1200 people and just had them, uh, had them go and evaluate each of the spots. It could get very granular down to what, like second by second, people can thumbs up or thumbs down each of the spots. And then you can really learn what aspect of one spot, even if they liked it, could, could be better. But overall, I think the most important takeaway was whether people after watching the spot, were they more likely or less likely to use your law firm, right? Because that's, that's what, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to create things to get more people to come to the law firm. So that's the big question. And um, the results of this market research was really fascinating. So what is it? Old school pitch, direct to camera, 55 right. less, uh, less likely to engage. What does that mean to engage? Okay. So, I'll, so we had three types of spots and we chose this for a specific reason because I went into it thinking, you know, this was an exploratory venture, right? I came into this industry as an outsider, right? Understanding general marketing principles, but everyone's saying you have to do it this way, the old school yelling and selling. And I'm like, I'm not sure that quite works anymore. I think it was that way for reason it worked before, but advertising has like how consumers uh, interact with advertising has changed. So we took an old school spot uh, that, was, that was well done, well shot, and we showed it to, um, to the audience, 1,200 people, and 55% of them said they were less likely to use that law firm. So less likely to engage the law firm. If they needed an injury lawyer, they would not go to that law firm, which is scary. That means that every dollar they spend, they're alienating more than half the audience. Wow. Yeah. And the it's same with dramatization with actors, very similar result. People are turned okay. off. I don't think that's referring to like our documentary style, including some actors as background, right? That's probably scripted or something like that, right? So, so, so for that, for the second spot, um, we chose a really high end, probably cost over a million dollars to produce. Um, it was scripted. It was funny. Like me watching it, I liked that spot mainly because I'm like, that was entertaining, right? It was an entertaining uh, spot. and the problem with this spot is that from my perspective, I understand the industry. So the moment, and I knew what I was watching, most of the people that were watching the spot, they were just confused at what this ad was for. You know, it was, it just didn't really, it wasn't until the very end when the logo showed, they're like, oh, it's an injury uh, lawyer ad. You know, so it, there's a lot of um, context that you would need to have in order to understand the spot. So that did better than the old school pitch, but it was 48% less likely to engage. Also, not good, right? That's not the desired effect you want from your, from your advertising. 
And just and, like and just like we predicted and just like we spoke about, people are looking for authenticity now. I think that's evident by you know, people having cell phones and they're getting used to seeing real people saying real things. So the contrived stuff doesn't work nearly as well uh, as it used to, right? Dan, what's the most important takeaway out of all the things we spoke about today? We're talking to prospective clients. We're talking to people in the industry. They're overwhelmed by branding, maybe. They're overwhelmed by the, should I do it myself? Should I hire a pro? How much should I pay? Standing on one leg, what's your advice to someone who's asking you, should I do it myself? How much should I pay? How, how, do, you, how do you evaluate your business, your company, when to spend, when not to spend? What do you think? I think just get a few things down, um, what you want to accomplish and who you're speaking to in terms of your video, and then talk to a professional about it because they'll have a better idea of what levers they can pull and what would be possible at you know a lot of different dollar values and they'll be able to tell you what can be done and then also you know if you hire them like we've kind of demonstrated um today they'll be able to pull the best material out of what you do shoot they'll be able to strategize to shoot in the best way to get the most done that can be turned into the most um videos so i'd say hire a pro shocking right <laughs> And Dennis, uh, another question I have for you is the progression of advertising. You guys were doing TV advertising, and now you're moving on to digital. Could you describe what's happening? Um, maybe we're moving to digital because it's more trackable. Maybe we're moving to digital because it's cheaper. Tell us where Rothenberg was in their advertising back in the day and where they are and where they're going. Right. So the so for the up until recent, the recent years, the predominant amount of marketing dollars, um, our marketing budget went towards traditional broadcast television. And with the advent of Google, Google search, and eventually YouTube, I think that, and also kind of the disbursement of the general um, like the television market, right? There's just so many more channels, so many more places. There's Netflix. So everyone's dispersed that it no longer makes sense to spend that much money on television. And you add on the fact that you can't, it's very difficult to track. So we are venturing uh, further into YouTube, um, and, but the, the, the principles still remain the same. Like whether you're showing it on YouTube, whether you're showing it on broadcast television, um, it, it, you wanna be human, you want to lead with your values, um, and you want to be authentic and genuine. Excellent, thank you so much. We're just ready to wrap up. And, you know, I, uh, Dan works out of our office sometimes, so he's generous. He lends us those uh, Emmys that belong to Dan. I've been involved in Emmy Award winning shows myself, but Dan's got me beat. Tell me what it's like to win an Emmy, because everybody is so fascinated by this, Dan. Talk to us a little bit how you got them, and is it hard? Is it easy? Is it fun? I mean, I never really expected to, you know, be to win Emmys or win a lot of them and you know a good amount of them I was just a member of the team I was a lower level producer um, at a smaller style production company but I did win three individual Emmys that I mentioned for writing for shooting and for producing um, that I'm really very proud of and you know I'm, I'm kind of a weird guy you know I don't love small talk but somehow when I'm standing at a podium in front of you know thousands of people I have no problem giving an acceptance speech kind of black out so it feels great you know the, the writing one was really important to me and that was I think maybe the last one I won so that was that was really cool to to win that um, what was it what was it what was the subject it was writing for we did a uh, sports television show, half an hour called, at first it was called The Game 365, and then it transitioned to Focused. Um, it aired on MSG Network on New York and on regional sports networks across the country. Um, and I was really proud of me and the team because I felt like we took The Game 365, which was already a great show and already got syndicated, and we brought it to a higher level and higher production value um, and changed it to Focused to kind of kind of reboot with a with a higher level of production and i'd been nominated two or three times for writing before for the game 365 
and I think it was the first year with Focused, I won for writing. And I think the writing was better. I got better. But I also think the package that I was wrapped up in may have affected the judges a little bit too in order to uh, ultimately uh, decide that Focus was the best written you know, program for that year. Excellent. Dennis, what was your most exciting piece of work you've done in the last uh, four years that you're really proud of and, and happy the way it came out? I mean, I would have to say, I mean, I'm happy with a lot of the spots with the branding spot. That's a long spot. That's the one that we want to uh, deploy front and center on our website because when people come to our website, that's what I want to lead with. It, it has uh, footage from all of the partners, right? Some attorneys and paralegal. And it really, it's a culmination of what we learned. Um, and it really just puts on full display what I love best about the Rothenberg Law Firm, which is that there are family people that have dedicated themselves to helping people for over five decades. That's tremendous. And to really, to be able to capture that, that aspect into a five minute video, really cool, really important. I think it's gonna do great things and it's gonna help a lot of people that need a good law firm to go to. Thank you so much. You know, I wanna thank both of you for coming along today. And with that thought, another thought comes to mind for DMJ, our brand is making the world a better place one video at a time. And we're very blessed with clients like the Rothenberg Law Firm who are really helping people. We've worked with a lot of nonprofits over the years the same way. So it's the brand, it's who we are, it's what we represent. And I believe that ultimately that's what a lot of people are talking about with personal branding, who you are, what's your authenticity. It's, that's the way to form trust and that's the way to form clients. So we wanna thank everybody for coming today. We want to congratulate the first two winners we announced in the beginning of the show, and we're having some technical difficulties picking the other winners, so we're going to notify you guys. Thanks, everybody, for coming, and please, we'll be sending out a recording. Feel free to send in your questions, your comments, and your suggestions. Thanks again for joining us for Branding Through Video.